ch change from glory into glory makes a case for being the most beautiful line in the hymnal, doesn't it? There's competition for that title, but that is, that is up there, a uh, amazing line. I'd like, to, I'd like to begin this morning with a, a survey or short questionnaire uh, by, uh, by a show of hands. Uh, I wonder how many of you have had that anxiety dream where it is the final day of school and you are entirely unprepared for the final exam. All right, so it's about, about half of the crowd, it looks like. I didn't check the choir there. What's, what's the numbers there? Okay, even, even more in the choir. And uh, I'm, okay, for those of you who answered yes to that, uh, how many of you been, have been out of school for quite some time and yet had that dream recently? Yeah, okay, so most of, most of, most of the folks who uh, uh, said yes have had that recently. I think that dream is hardwired at the factory. It's one that, we, uh, one that we show up with. I had a variation on that dream recently in which I, uh, I learned that I had been uh, booked into a major theater to give a performance as a singer-songwriter. Uh, it was going to be uh, an evening with Martin Elford is what the, uh, what the, what the billboard was going to say. And I was going to uh, sit up on stage on a stool in the spotlight with my guitar and play my songs for, I don't know how long an evening with Martin Alford is, two hours. I was going to play my songs. I was pretty excited to get this, uh, uh, this invitation. This is a major step forward in my career. And I was uh, looking, forward to, uh, looking forward to the evening. I heard it was sold out. Uh, there really were only two difficulties. Uh, the first is that I don't play the guitar. And the second is that I've never written any songs. So this is the, this is the Sunday uh, in which, in particular, we name that we are the stewards of Grace Memorial. In particular, we name we are the financial stewards of Grace Memorial. We, uh, we name that uh, through our financial gifts and through, as well as the gifts of our volunteerism and our prayers and so forth, uh, we make this place possible. And later on, you'll be invited to bring your pledge card to the, uh, to the altar, uh, an offering to God. Uh, we, we set this date a while back. Uh, November 19th was going to be the day uh, when we would uh, bring our pledge cards to the altar. And then I looked at the lectionary the schedule of readings that we follow from one Sunday to the next. I don't know if, if all of you know, but the lectionary is uh, sort of set at head office and we, uh, we follow it across the years. If you want to know what we're going to be reading in five years, you can find out. Uh, the lectionary will tell us. So I opened up the lectionary and saw today's gospel and uh, uh, became irritated. I felt irritated. This is not the reading that I probably would have chosen to talk about financial stewardship. Uh, the story uh, goes like this. Uh, there is a very wealthy man, and that man owns slaves. So already we know something about this person, and he is going to go on a vacation. So he summons, uh, he summons his three slaves uh, before him. There's one whom he really trusts and brings that slave forward and says, uh, slave uh, number one, I'm going to give you a billion dollars. Please take care of it. And off that slave goes. The second one comes who he trusts a little less. And he says, I'm going to give you $200 million. And off goes that slave. And then the third comes who's sort of a ne'er-do-well uh, slave. Uh, and the rich man says to him, here's a hundred million dollars, and off they go. And then the, uh, uh, the rich man packs his bags, and he gets onto his private jet, and off he leaves to, I don't know, where do rich people vacation? To a private island. Off he goes. And the slaves, uh, they're, they're left by themselves, and the first one gets to work. He takes the billion dollars, and he buys Apple stock, and he turns it into two billion dollars. And the second one goes and buys real estate in San Francisco. And he turns the 200 million into 400 uh, million dollars. The third slave, however, knows, uh, knows the master. He knows his violence, he knows his anger, and he is afraid, uh, with good reason. 
And so he, he takes the $100 million that he's received from the master and he puts it in a box and he buries it in the garden behind the tomatoes. And there it waits. Well, time passes and then one day, uh, like a thief in the night, you don't know the hour or the day, uh, back comes the master, a private plane lands, they hear it in the distance and they hear the wheels touching down. So outrun, outrun the slaves and they, um, put out the red carpet and the master comes down. And the first one goes up and says, uh, you know how you gave me a billion dollars? I've made it into two billion dollars. And the master says, well done, uh, you're promoted, although you're still a slave. And the uh, second one comes forward and says, I, I got, took your 200 million and I made it to 400 million. And the master says, well done. Now, so in jokes and in parables, things happen in threes, right? It is, it's the breaking of the pattern on the third time that makes it funny or surprising or instructive. Uh, there's a reason Goldilocks, there's three porridges and three beds and so forth, right? And so the third slave who breaks the pattern comes forward and says, uh, he gives the most extraordinary speech to the master. He's got this box in his hand with the money in it and he says, master, I knew you were a psychopath. I knew you were a terrible, terrible person who visits violence on people, and so I was afraid to do anything. So I took your money, I put it in a box, I buried it behind the tomatoes. It's fine, it's all here, it's a little dirty and it smells like tomatoes, but here's your money. And what does the master say in return? It's an absolutely extraordinary speech. He just agrees. He agrees with the third slave. He says, you knew I was a psychopath, you're right. And now I'm gonna turn my psychopathing on you. Start practicing gnashing your teeth because you have an all expenses paid trip, paid to the outer darkness. Off you go. And the moral of the story is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The end. So perfect, right? For talking about financial stewardship in a church and inspiring you inspiring you to make a, make a gift uh, to this place and to our ministry uh, here at Grace Memorial, just what I would have chosen. Something I've started wondering about uh, as, I, as I get older, as I've lived more life, uh, something that I, I've started to suspect or have a hunch is that uh, when I feel irritated, that frequently means there's a lesson waiting for me in a situation or with another person. I would, as a child, I would say, uh, my, my classmate Doug is irritating. Uh, and then I, I, I started to wonder looking back in that, I think it would be more accurate or honest to say, when I'm with Doug, I feel irritated. That's a different thing. I don't think that Doug is like ontologically irritating. I don't know that a, that a group of uh, objective observers would all agree that Doug was an irritating, well they might, but I think, but not always. Uh, that's actually data about me when I am feeling irritation in Doug's presence. And similarly, often when I feel irritated with scripture, that's an invitation to wonder what lesson might be waiting for me. It's an invitation into curiosity, an invitation to maybe go deeper into the text. And I suspect the reason that I feel irritated with this text, uh, and maybe the reason some of you had a reaction to it as well, is that we have, without really naming it out loud, uh, received a message that there's a correct way of reading this text. And in particular, we have internalized a message, many of us, I should speak for myself, I've internalized a message that the correct way to interpret this text is allegorically. So uh, this text has characters who are stand-ins for uh, other people uh, or, or other theological figures, and it's sort of our job to get out the decoder ring and figure out who stands in for who. And in, I think, the most common reading of this, uh, this allegory, uh, the, the master would be God. 
uh, and we are the slaves. Some of us have a great deal of talent. We, are, we become rock stars. We become uh, the president. Some of us have less talent, but we still have pretty good lives. Some of us have very little talent indeed, uh, but we can still do our, do our best. And maybe that's an okay reading of the story, but I have two problems with it. The, the first is that uh, it, it kind of sends us away with a fairly harmless moral of the story. The moral is you might have more talent, you might have less, but you need to try. Uh, you need to take risks that are appropriate in nature. You need to live your life fully. Uh, and that's, that's good advice, I guess. That's advice I can imagine uh, giving to a child. Like, uh, it's painful when we witness someone who never takes a risk in their life, who kind of has an unlived life. Those are sad people to meet. Or it's sad if, when we sometimes are that, are those folks. And so, sure, that's good advice. But my experience with Jesus, I mean, the more time I spend with Jesus in many ways, the more mysterious I find his parables and his teachings. But my, one of the things I'm kind of confident about is that he rarely gives us harmless lessons. He rarely te teaches us things that would just sort of go on a fridge magnet or go on a, uh, on, a, on a greeting card. He is way more challenging than that. Uh, to borrow a line from John Bell, um, Jesus in his parables and his stories inspires and disarms and confuses. We often sit with Jesus and say, I'm not, I'm not sure what just happened. So I, I think there, if we've got a harmless reading on a parable, my sense is that may very well be mistaken. The second reason, uh, reason that I don't like this allegorical reading of this story is that uh, it makes God terrible. It makes God into a, uh, a violent tyrant uh, who is ready to visit uh, violence on us if we live our lives incorrectly. I don't think that is the God who is my shepherd. I don't think that is the God who leads me uh, through the valley of the shadow of death, who sets a table for me uh, before my enemies. That doesn't sound like that God at all. It doesn't sound like the God who Jesus knows and calls Father. So I think that may be mistaken. A few commentators have tried to kind of fix the allegorical reading by saying, well, maybe the third slave is supposed to be Jesus. And I guess so, because certainly that slave endures something like crucifixion at the end. But this, is, this then makes Jesus afraid of Pontius Pilate, which Jesus is not. So I, I, th my, I want to actually see if we can step away from the allegorical reading of this. Uh, if we can allow that Jesus has said, the kingdom of, uh, of heaven is like, not uh, the kingdom of heaven uh, can be understood via the following allegory. What if he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like and we're invited to decide for ourselves what genre of story we're listening to. And what if the genre of story that Jesus is telling us about is not allegory, but rather is anxiety dream? So I want to I want to tell you the second half of my my dream about uh, my sing singer songwriter career. Uh, and I've never I've never had this anxiety dream go this direction before. Uh, so I realized the gig was coming up. Uh, always in the dream, you get incredibly little notice. In real life, I think concerts are booked quite far in advance, but of course the concert is like in three days and I'm totally unprepared for it uh, and what's gonna happen. And I, I don't know if at this point I became aware I was dreaming and I was able to bring an element of lucidity to it or if just the Holy Spirit showed up in that moment uh, because the dream went a really different direction. It's a few days to the concert. I'm totally, I don't know how to play the guitar. I've never written a song. And someone showed up who said, well, I know how to play a guitar and I'm willing to play the guitar with you at the concert. And other people who said, well, I know how to play instruments showed up and I will play with the guitarist. There can be an entire band. And then other people showed up who said, I've written songs and you can sing my songs at the concert. And so this whole community came together and come the evening of the performance, we all went together on stage 
and I was able to sing, not at a professional level, but at an okay level, and these other people uh, played music with me, and we, we shared the songs all these people had written, and at the end, the audience applauded. There's a new ending to the anxiety dream. Sometimes a, a really good teacher will deliberately suggest a bad idea to you uh, and invite you to say, no, I think that's mistaken. Uh, I don't think that's how things are. And I, I think Jesus is offering this anxiety dream to us, this dream that actually looks a lot like our lives do sometimes. It looks a lot like consumerism. It looks a lot like individualism. It looks a lot like an obsession with money. In this anxiety dream, it's up to you and you alone to make it through this life. And if you make enough money, uh, then you are lovable and good and you will be rewarded for that. But if you don't, if you fail at making money, you will be rejected. You will be cast into the outer darkness the outer darkness in Portland being a tent on the sidewalk. I think Jesus invites us to say that's not what the kingdom needs to look like. That isn't what the kingdom looks like. There is a choice for us to together build the kingdom. What if there was a different dream where the slaves collaborated with one another to create something beautiful, to step away from the oppression of the master, to find freedom and joy. What would that dream look like? And if that's right, if Jesus is inviting us via this anxiety dream to wonder together about what's possible, then this might really be an okay parable with which to talk about financial stewardship. For those of us who, um, who look at budgets, we sit on, on vestry, if you have my job, uh, uh, we spend a good part of the year fretting, worrying about money. Uh, in your own life, you may spend time worrying about money. It can be lonely uh, to have to do that. Uh, it can be lonely to be on the, the board of this church and say, oh gosh, are we going to make budget? Are we going to, are we going to be able to thrive and do our ministries in the coming year? Uh, sometimes it feels like we have to by ourselves figure this out. And that's a lonely story to have to tell. But what if, what if we don't have to do this by ourselves? What if we are called together to be the stewards of this church and we can together do things that we could never do on our own? What if together we can build on the ministries that have been handed to us by our ancestors and grow this church and deepen the ways in which it is a gift on Sundays and a gift to people across the week, a gift to so many neighbors, some of whom we've never even met? What if together we can choose a different ending to the anxiety dream, an end that looks like the kingdom, an end in which, with Jesus' help, we build something beautiful, we keep on building something beautiful. And maybe come the end of the performance, we will be surprised to find that there's a whole band with us, a whole group of songwriters with us, and the gathered audience, that great cloud of witnesses, will stand up and applaud 